Well, happy Easter. We are celebrating the fact that Jesus is alive. And today, I don't want that to be lost on what that means to each and every one of us that have gathered here to celebrate the life that we have in Jesus. And as we celebrate new birth, I want to celebrate the fact that our St. Pete campus is officially open today. We have preview services that have started today. And I'm not going to lie, I'm thankful for the people here at Crossroads at our Goshen and Mishawaka campuses that have sacrificially served. They've gone above and beyond this week to go down to Florida for spring break and be at the launch of our St. Pete campus. They have just sacrificed so much and have gone above and beyond uh, to serve in that way. I am excited to see that take off and come to life. And I believe we have amazing days ahead of us uh, in St. Pete as we launch our campus there today. Uh, but I want to focus today on the life that we have in Jesus and, and what it means to embrace that new life that he gives us. Because Easter changes everything. The fact that Jesus was dead, that he was buried, that he rose again, it changes everything. And I want to read this verse again before we dive into the resurrection story today. Ephesians 4, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Don't miss out on what it's saying there. Since you've heard about Jesus, since you've experienced what he has done, the life that you have in him, you've got to throw off that old life. There are things from your old life that don't come with you because Jesus changes you. It changes everything. Instead, Paul says, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. You see, there is a specific life that God calls us to, and it is true and it is real life. When we talk about being awake, being alive, that means my eyes are open to what Jesus has done. That means I am experiencing the life that he has offered me. That life is marked by forgiveness. It is marked by freedom. I am not who I once was, and that is something to be celebrated. And that means that my old life is gone. That means I have to embrace what is new. And I want you to think about that as we dive into the resurrection story today and talk about what that means to each and every one of us. I love what it says in John chapter 20, the account that we have of the resurrection of Jesus and, and how this was stumbled upon and how it changed everything immediately. It says in John chapter 20, Early on Sunday morning, do you resonate with that this morning? Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark... Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. Now that's John. That's him writing about himself in the gospel that he wrote for the Bible. He never names himself. He just calls himself the other disciple or the one who Jesus loved. She said to them, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple, John, started out for the tomb. They were both running, and the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Now, we need to pause there. This is a very important pastoral insight that you're about to receive here, all right? So lean in. Verse 4, John 20, verse 4, is a totally gratuitous verse in the Bible. You need to know this. All John is saying here is, Peter and I ran to the tomb. But I was faster than Peter. That's all he said. That's a little bit of a bragging right moment, right? That's all that that is. You need to know that, all right? So if you've ever talked trash to anybody or you, you had to one-up somebody, this is the ultimate. John is saying, I'm faster than Peter, and it's in the Bible now. So there's that. So you need to know. That's just how it is. It says, he stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw, and he believed. There's something I want you to notice in this passage of Scripture today. There actually is something that Jesus left behind. There is something that stayed in the grave. 
It was all the wrappings that had been used to bury Jesus. The cloth that had covered his face. Notice it was purposefully, it was intentionally left behind, folded neatly and laying right there in the tomb. I want you to think about the ramifications about that because the truth is resurrection, it means that some things come back to life. When we embrace the love of Jesus, when we experience new life, it means some things come back to life. But it also means that other things stay in the grave. I want you to think about that for a second, what that means. The old life that I put away, this new life that's different that I embrace, when I experience the resurrection life that Jesus offers me, yeah, there are things that come out of the grave. I experience life, true life, the way God intended it. But there are things that need to stay in the grave. Consider that in those days, there was, there was quite a process for, for burying people and how that was to be done. We see this also in, in the story of Lazarus where Jesus raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. He had been dead for four days. And when he came out of the tomb, he was still wearing all of these grave clothes. He had been wrapped in, they would wrap him around their legs, wrap him around their arms. There would typically be a sheet that covers the body and something else that covers the face. When Lazarus came out of the grave, he was still wearing all of his grave clothes. It was kind of an awkward moment. Everybody's like, get him out of those things. And the old King James instead. He's been in the grave for four days. Behold, he stinketh. That's what it says in the King James, and I always thought that was funny. I'm amused by that kind of, of, of speaking. And yet, when Jesus comes back to life, he is alive. He doesn't need those grave clothes anymore. He is no longer dead. He very intentionally takes those coverings off, leaves them behind. That stays in the grave. It would have been weird for Jesus to be walking around in his grave clothes. That's just not normal. When the stone was rolled away, it would be weird for Jesus to be rolling the stone around all over Jerusalem saying, I am not dead anymore, but I still got my grave clothes and my, my tombstone with me. That's not how it works. That's not, that's weird. I don't know if you understand this or not, uh, but we have weird things like that that actually happen in our culture today. For example, in downtown Elkhart, you need to know this, there is a mansion that is called the Winchester Mansion. Anybody familiar with this, the Winchester Mansion? It's right there in downtown Elkhart. I actually Googled this place because it's for sale. I was just curious as to what it looked like inside, what it had to offer, and I discovered immediately in my Google search that the Winchester Mansion is a documented haunted house in northern Indiana. Do you guys know this? This is real life right here in downtown Elkhart. So I did what any normal person would do. I called the real estate agent and I demanded a tour. I wanted to tour this place. And I invited our staff here at Crossroads to join me on the tour. You would be surprised out of our staff which half said, no way am I going on that tour. And the other half that said, oh yeah, let's do this. I'm all in. I'll let you guys guess as to who is who and let everyone else, you know, Keep, keep all their pride, what's left of it, uh, after we mocked them mercilessly for not going on the haunted house tour. What's weird about the story of the Winchester Mansion is that they say it's haunted by the ghost of Nellie Knickerbocker. I'm just giving you great facts here, all right? This is real life. Um, and they say that the story of this house comes from the fact that when her husband died way back when, she loved his casket so much that she bought a matching casket for herself and had it on display in the entrance to this mansion for the rest of her life. Weird, right? Like you don't really walk through life thinking about that. Like, have you seen my casket? It is legit. I can't wait. You know what I'm saying? It's weird. That's not how you live, right? That's for the grave. We're not dead. We're alive. And that's what we learn from these really important details from the resurrection story. Jesus didn't need those grave clothes anymore. Not everything came out of the grave. There are things in our life that need to stay in the grave. When God calls us to new life, we are called to experience life to the fullest. That's what Jesus came here for. The thief, the devil, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I contend that means the devil's here to steal your joy, to kill your spirit, to destroy your soul. And Jesus says, I'm not having anything to do with that. I've come to give you life, real life, life to the full, life that is marked by forgiveness, life that is marked by freedom. This is the life that changes everything. And what we can't do is try to cram our old life in with the new life. It, it doesn't work. There are things that have to stay in the grave. 
And I want to answer that question today. What is it that needs to stay in the grave? Because too often we try to bring things with us that just don't belong in the new life that God has called us to. I think the first thing we can recognize is something that we try to bring out of the grave with us is our past. When I encounter Jesus and I am given new life, everything changes. Never forget that when you accept Jesus, when you say yes to Jesus, he offers you true freedom, complete and total forgiveness. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he separates your sin from you. It gives another word picture in the Bible that he just throws your sin into the ocean and it rests on the ocean floor. You are never going to get that back. It's gone. But a lot of times we try to drag our past with us with all the, the fears, with all the, the insecurities, with that sense of failure that comes with it, all of the guilt, all of the shame. We bring that out of the grave with us. And you guys, it needs to stay in the grave. Paul speaks to this in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. We must embrace this new life. When you say yes to Jesus, you are no longer who you once were. The past is the past. You might carry some of the consequences from your past, but that is not who you are any longer. You are a child of God. He has placed his name on you. And this changes everything. If you're being haunted by your past, leave it in the grave. You don't have to walk in guilt or shame or fear or a sense of some type of failure or insecurity. No, God loves you with an extravagant love. He has offered you new life. Embrace that life and leave the past in the grave. I think the other thing that we need to address is our patterns. There are patterns of the old life that have no place in the new life. There are patterns that need to stay in the grave. What are we talking about? Well, I think sometimes that's our friendships. I think we have friendships that tie us back to our past that aren't healthy for us. They're not good influences on us. Sometimes we need to change our friendships. I would contend with you today that your closest friends, your inner circle of friends, need to be people who love Jesus just like you do, who will encourage you in your journey with Jesus, who will hold you accountable, who will help encourage you in your journey with Jesus and help you become more like him. We gotta change our patterns, our behaviors, our routines, our habits, our addictions. All of these patterns in life these patterns of the old life, they didn't lead us anywhere good. They have no place in the new life. In fact, when we talk about the devil saying, I've come to steal and kill and destroy, the big lie and deception that he gives us is that all these things that we chase in, in the old life are going to somehow bring us fulfillment, somehow bring us the joy and the peace that we are looking for. And yet they never satisfy all of these things on the world, uh, that the world has to offer us, whether it's, it's possessions or pleasure or power, whatever category you're chasing after, those things never satisfy. And those patterns of the old life, you guys, they have no place in the new life. We've got to cut the ties to the past. We've got to develop new patterns that help us draw closer to Jesus. This is where the importance of our spiritual disciplines become so incredibly important to us making sure that I'm spending time with Jesus, that I'm drawing close to him, that I'm surrounding myself with friends that are going to encourage me and hold me accountable in my faith, that I'm intentionally living my life each and every day purposefully, investing my time and my life in things that have eternal value, in things that have eternal significance. What are some of the patterns in your life that need to stay in the grave? Make sure that your, your habits, your routines, your friendships are embracing the new life and hoping you live life to the fullest. It says in Mark chapter 2, this is Jesus speaking, he says, no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the wine would burst the wineskins, and the wine and the skins would both be lost. New wine calls for new wineskins. 
Jesus is alluding to something that was a very common practice back in those days. You would put your new wine into a new wine skin, and as that grape juice would ferment, it would expand that skin. It usually made out of goat skin, and it would just grow with the fermentation. But if you used an old wine skin and poured grape juice in again, and it went through that process, it would just blow it up like a water balloon. It would just be terrible, and everything's lost. And what Jesus is pointing out is that, you know, the old way of life, the old pattern, it's got to be different Everything changes when you encounter Jesus. He is offering you new life. The old pattern, the old way of life, it it doesn't fit. Stop trying to cram your old life into your new life. It's time to develop new patterns and to embrace life to the fullest. That brings us to our last thing that I believe needs to stay in the grave, and that's my pain. We were talking about our past. No more insecurity, no more guilt and shame. Leave that in the grave. We're talking about my patterns, my old way of life, my friendships, my addictions, my habits, my routines. Those are all things that need to change. We can't cram all of that stuff from the old life in with the new life. But I think oftentimes the most difficult thing to leave in the grave, when I run to Jesus and I experience new life, the most difficult thing to leave there is the pain. It's the pain. It's all the wounds that we have that we carry with us those things that hold us back, that make us question our faith, that make us doubt, God, why would you allow this to happen to me? And this gets deep, this gets real, because there are a lot of people who experience deep pain. I want to encourage you with a verse. Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 3, is a prophecy that is fulfilled in the life of Jesus in Luke chapter 4. An unbelievable prophecy about who Jesus is and what he offers. Isaiah prophesied, The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning. Festive praise instead of despair. This is an amazing promise, an amazing insight to who Jesus is and what he longs for each of us to experience in this new life that he offers. He comes to heal the brokenhearted. He comes to redeem your pain. He gives you beauty for your ashes. And he sets the captive free. I think a lot of times when it comes to our pain, we've been wounded. And we allow that wound to just stay open. As soon as it begins to heal, maybe it starts to scab over. You pick the scab off and it's an open wound again. You're going, oh, Tim, it's 7 o'clock in the morning. Why are you talking about disgusting things like that? Well, it's what we do. We let our pain control us. We let our pain prevent us from experiencing the new life that Jesus longs for us to experience. I think sometimes we've just got to surrender that pain to Jesus. We've got to let it become a scar. And we've got to allow him to work in us to redeem that pain because he takes what the enemy intends for evil and he uses it. He transforms it. He changes it. He brings life to it. He uses it for good. So we've got to leave our past behind. We've got to leave that in the grave. We've got to leave our patterns behind because the old patterns don't fit with the new life that God has called us to. You can't cram the old life with the new. That stuff's got to stay in the grave. You have to leave that behind. But I think most importantly, you've got to leave your pain in the grave. You've got to let the power and the life of Jesus transform that pain and trade beauty for ashes because that's who Jesus is and that's what he longs to bring you today I want to encourage you not everything comes out of the tomb but what's been coming with you what is it that needs to stay in the grave I want to ask you today have you embraced what Jesus has done for you well we are celebrating this Easter morning It changes everything. He offers us 
new life. The devil, the thief, comes to steal your joy, to kill your spirit, to destroy your soul. He wants you to experience nothing that Jesus offers you. But Jesus comes so that we might have life and have it to the full. That is what we celebrate on Easter Sunday. That is what changes everything. But not everything comes to that new life. Some of that old way of life, it has to stay in the grave. And I ask you today, what is it in your life that needs to stay in the grave? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning? As we celebrate the new life that we have in Jesus, I'm going to ask you, is there something from your past that you need to keep in the grave today? You've been dealing with guilt and shame, maybe fears or sense of failure, insecurity. That's not from Jesus. Leave that in the grave. If you've been dealing with some patterns in your life, some behaviors that you know they don't belong in the new life. It's time to surrender those patterns. Maybe it's a friendship. Maybe it's a habit. It's a routine. It could be an addiction. It's time to give that to Jesus. Keep it in the grave and embrace the life that Jesus has called you to. Maybe it's your pain. Maybe you've been holding on to this pain for so long that you don't know what to do with it anymore. That pain doesn't belong in the new life. That pain... It needs to stay in the grave. I want to encourage you today and challenge you. Let Jesus redeem that pain. Trade that pain. Trade those ashes for beauty. Because Jesus has come to heal the brokenhearted. He has come to set the captive free. He has come to bring us new life. So let's embrace that life today and leave that stuff in the grave. Jesus, we thank you today for who you are, for the incredible love that you have for us and the power that you have over sin, over death, and the grave. I pray, God, that you would help us to embrace the new life that you offer us, life that is full, life that is filled with peace and hope and joy that only you can bring us. God, may we keep the old life in the past. May it stay in the grave. And may we run out of that grave embracing, Jesus, the fullness of this new life that we have in you. Jesus, for all that you've done for us, we just give you thanks and we give you praise because you are worthy, Jesus. We pray this today in your holy name. Amen.